Good evening, Meruchim Abayim Ravotai. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night's class. Tonight's class was sponsored in memory of, we have a list here, Zina Bat Yafa, David Ben, Zina, David Ben, Ima Shalom, and Rifka Bat Yafa. Tehei nafsham tzura b'tzora chayim b'ganed al-anyon. We're all the tzadikim and chasidim, and tzadikot and chasidot. Amen ve amen. All right, so we're starting on the uh, Elul season of classes. We'll see if we can uh, hopefully have Siyat Deshmaya and go four for four this time. This year Elul is a little challenging for a lot of people from a uh, technical standpoint. When Elul is in the middle of October, in the middle of August, we kind of feel like it's the middle of summer vacation. And it's very far from it, and it's hard to adapt. But the good news is, the harder it is, uh, the more reward you get. So if you went to Slichot this week, and while your friends went to the beach, because it's still beach weather, 95 degrees outside or whatever, then you get so much more reward for it, so you accomplish so much more. It's, uh, yeah. And the school system also, they start so late, the kids uh, barely start school and it's already Rosh Hashanah, they have no time to really learn. Thank God for the yeshiva system that still stayed normal and started Rosh Chodesh Elul. It's a shame that everybody doesn't do that. So, the idea behind everything in the next, well by now it's not 40 days anymore because we're already a few days in, is to get to be ready for a, a positive outcome. This is an investment period that we look to invest to reap benefits. So we make an investment now so that on Kippur, God should say, Salach Varecha, that He forgives us and we start over again. The problem is, is the Yetzirah is at full force that we shouldn't succeed at this mission because He knows that on the most critical day, which is Yom Kippur, He doesn't have any power. So he tries to do whatever he could for the 39 days before that. So by then he already won, and when Kippur comes around, he's not needed anymore. And the best way to fight your enemy is to come prepared. And knowledge is the best way to be prepared. So we'll try and expand on our knowledge on a technical level of an attitude that we can approach these holy days in order to actually get an outcome, and a positive outcome. An outcome's not enough. An outcome everybody's going to have, but a positive outcome. I give a disclaimer, everybody knows I'm not into the negative campaign of oh, how many problems there were this year and how, much people, how many people suffered and how many people died, right? And especially in a year like this, we can sell that very easily, um, just like we could have done it last year as well. Because I think there's something extremely arrogant and disgusting towards God for that. Because for every person who tragically died this year, how many people were born and born healthy? And for every unfortunate circumstance, how many positive things happened. And for every person who lost his living, how many new people made fortunes. And it's just not fair to always see the negative and to talk about the negative instead of the opposite. And not that we're undermining tragedies that happened to families with losses of loved ones or other things, but it would only be fair to discuss that if we would first discuss the tens of thousands of boys and girls that were born in the Orthodox Jewish communities around the world healthy, and many other things like that, and then also discuss the struggles that we have. So, I have a very optimistic attitude. And I'll tell you in advance, I sincerely believe that when Rosh Hashanah Kippur comes, God looks at every Jew in today's generation and says, if you're in a synagogue and you're proud to be Jewish, you're my boy, you're my girl, and you're okay. And then I believe that to my core, I don't doubt it. Because if that's not true, then Mashiach's never coming. That has to be true by definition if we believe Mashiach's coming. But at the same time, some sort of effort you do have to put in. I'll give you an example from the parenting world. There are many parents that God bless them that they're comfortable. They have established family businesses and other things. And they can provide for their children a lot. But in wise parenting, we provide for our children unlimited, contingent to one thing. That they show that they're willing to make some sort of effort. But if a kid wants to be a bum, then at that point, when his parents feed into it and just give him everything, they're not doing anything positive by that. They're just teaching him to stay a bum forever. Now, of course, the rich kid's family has a, he has a huge advantage that he's coming at a much higher starting point than everybody. 
But that's assuming that his parents knew to teach him to do something. I uh, had a business interaction yesterday with a very, very successful youngster. And he comes from a wealthy family. And I asked him straight out, because we're friendly. I said, so you're rolling high in daddy's money? Is that what you're doing? In those words. He told me yes and no. So I said, you want to elaborate? So I said, sure. He said, my father made me a deal when I finished college that I was going into a specific financial sector, that he's going to back me in my initial investment in my business. And for the first few years that it takes to build up the business, for every dollar I make, he'll give me 10 times the amount so I have enough to live very comfortably. But if I don't make a dollar, he's not giving me a dollar either. How smart parenting. Show that you're willing to do something, and then of course we'll give you everything. But some sort of effort you have to make. So yes, we get about a 99.9% .9 discount in this generation due to societal things and other things. And the, the way Rav Uri Zohar quotes of Gaon Mivilna and all his speeches is that in the generation of Mashiach, the, they're not even called Shogigim anymore. They're, they're Am Yisrael's Anusim and Oynes is Rachman Patri. Hashem says you patu. But if you don't make any effort at all, so then you don't get that free pass. If you make some effort, then Hashem gives you a free pass after that. So it's important to gauge what's the effort that's expected of us in order to later on obtain a relatively free pass to things. So there's a parable that's brought down in many different contexts, but it's the same punchline, so it makes no difference which way you want to word it, of a guy who has a very big opportunity in his life that he's coming towards. I've heard this in so many different versions over the years from different rabbis and rabbeim of mine. Um, the most utilized one is his wedding day. But he has a personal struggle which can damage the positive outcome that he should have. Now even if things go wrong for him on his, good on his special day, assuming that there was a, a certain amount of precaution taken to prevent it, and an effort put in to make it happen, then it slides and it's forgiven. But if there was no effort and no care and no nothing, so then, yeah, it's a big problem. There's something really wrong with that. That's the analogy of El. Right now, God's going to look at us for this 30-day period and see how much effort did you put in, even to fake it, but just to show me that you care. On any level. Each one, wherever he's at in life. Any effort. As long as that was done, then from there on Hashem says, I'm with you. I'm proud of you. But if even that's not done, that's kind of reckless and kind of silly. Now we do see conflicting, what seems to be, at least on a shallow level, conflicting opinions in the Psukim about God's attitude towards judgment. The Ramchal addresses the great length. The Ramchal wrote a big part of a sefer just about this. Um, on one hand, it seems like that the Pasuk says in Varim Lamed Bet, Dalid, Hatsul Tamim Paolo, Kichol Rachav Mishpat, all God's ways are judgment. Eile Muna Ve'en Avel, Tzadik V'yasharu, God's the a straight, righteous judge, meaning there's rules and there's a reward and consequence system and that's the way the world runs. To the point that Chazal learned from there, Kol HaOmer HaKadosh Baruch Hu Vatran Yivatru Me'av God forbid it's a curse. If somebody says, yeah, God just forgives and forgets, He lets everything slide, then Chazal curse him, that will have abdominal issues. His gut should come out. So that sounds pretty intense, harsh, however you want to word it. On the flip side, we see the opposite extreme in the Psukim. That uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, time and time again, says how He forgives Am Yisrael and He just lets things go and He's forgiven them even for the worst sins over and over again. And, and He structured Judaism in a way that there's constant forgiveness. We say, Slach lano avinu ki chatano three times a day. That means that there's a... a, a it's not lip service, right? Because if it was lip service, then that's also an insult. You don't say, I'm sorry, if you don't mean it. And you don't say, I'm sorry, if you're not getting anything from it. So obviously, God's constantly forgiving. So it seems like they kind of contradict. If it's the God of justice and who's so strict, then where's all this forgiveness coming? If it's the God of forgiveness, then wh wh how, how does that fit the justice bill? 
So Ramchal asked this question. More than that, Ramchal adds on that when God initially created the world, He created the world in a system of judgment. He saw that the world wouldn't survive even a minute. So He changed it to a system that has mercy within the judgment. So Ramchal says, so if Hashem created the world bedin and saw that it doesn't work, so then why the psukim later on still stick to this, the analogy of the God of justice? Mercy is not justice. Mercy is being very lenient with the justice system. Really, you deserve A, but in reality, you get away with it. So how do these, how do these things coincide? So Ramchal has three approaches. Two out of three are very similar. The first one is, Ramchal says, that God really should strike a person in action to the good or the bad. I Meaning, you did something good, you should get rewarded right away. You did something bad, God forbid the opposite. In reality, that doesn't happen. Not to the good and not to the bad. If it does happen, it happens to the good a little more. But definitely not to the bad. Unfortunately, I'm sure all of us witnessed people that turned on a light on Shabbat and they didn't get electrocuted. Everything's fine. Even though the Torah says, The reason is, is because Hashem is ma'arichaf. And soon we'll talk about that at greater length, what that means. But God has patience. He waits. Waits to see what the outcome is going to be. So, the Ramchal says that's the answer. On one hand, yeah, there is a verdict of what should happen. But the mercy comes in is that it should happen, but now we're going to postpone it for a long time and see if the guy will rectify it in the interim. That's answer one. The Ramchal says the second answer that, uh, to give a parable from today's, uh, it's hard for me to use the term justice system because the only thing that the system is is not justice, but the American court system, we'll call it, um, their sentencing guidelines, if any of you are lawyers, then you know this very well, now, sentencing guidelines are very vague terms. There's minimum mandatory sentences, and they go all the way up. And now it's to the judge or the jury or whatever's discretion, depending on the situation, um, and depending on many other factors. Within those guidelines, what happens to a person who did a specific crime? So, for the same exact crime that two different people did, one can get two years, and one can get 20, or one can get probation, and one... So, the Ramchal writes that there is the God of just, which is the most severe, and severe is not only in the negative, obviously it's many, more, many times over in the positive, in every circumstance, but then God says the world won't survive that way, and people will just give up. So within that, we made guidelines, and part of those guidelines have a lot of leniency in them, and a lot of forgiveness in them, and take into consideration many other factors as well not just the actual action of the person. That's Ramchal's second approach. And the third approach, which is the one I want to take the, put the emphasis on tonight, is that Ramchal says that unlike any other judicial system in the world, in God's judicial system, there's forgive and forget. Forgiveness. Nobody goes in front of a judge and pleads guilty to a crime and then says, I'm sorry, and the judge says, okay, get out of here. It doesn't work like that. But in God's court system, the person pleads guilty to a crime and says, I'm sorry, and he's off the hook. God just says, okay, let's move on. So on one hand, there is a justice system, but there's also a way around it. And that way around it is obtaining forgiveness. Now we obtain forgiveness through repentance. Sir Ramchal says that in the human grasp of right and wrong and what a person deserves or doesn't deserve, that makes no sense. You broke a window, pay for it. There's no way around that. It's only something that from an eternal view, when we see the world from such a high perspective, we can grasp what it means that we can eliminate one's actions. And Ramchal elaborates on this a lot. He wrote a lot, a lot of pages to explain this concept in many different ways. And the punchline is, he says, it's a chesed Hashem, it's a kindness from God. 
but he says it's not just a kindness. His term is that he uses, it's very interesting. He takes an example from a halacha in the Torah. In the Torah there's ilchot halachot of nedarim. Atarat nedarim, afarat nedarim, different situations. We're not going to learn the whole masech of nedarim now. But in a very simplistic example, somebody went and promised in the form of an edar that he's going to do a specific thing, or will not do a specific thing, and then realized that if he would have known the, the whole picture and the facts and what it would entail, he would have never made that promise. He can go in front of a chacham. It doesn't need three people. Today, a chacham is able to be matil and edit. Today, I don't know if there's a criteria of a chacham, so that's why it's done with three, three or ten people, depending on what type of thing. And he could be matir or mefer the neder. Mefer is not that way, but he could be matir the neder. What does matir the neder mean? Technically, he has a commitment to do A under circumstance A. He made a neder. He's never walking into this and this property. He got into a fight with his friend. He made a neder. I'm never coming to your house. Two days later, he realized, I'm like, crazy. The guy didn't mean what he said. I want to go to his house. Why would I want to have a fight with another person? The whole thing's stupid. He goes to Chacham and says, if I would have realized what an idiot I am, and that he didn't even mean what he did. I would have never made this nether. So I have karata, I regret the whole thing in the first place. And the Chacham tells him, Utarlach, done. Now what does that mean, done? Now that he does go into his friend's house, is he going against his promise at this point? No. When, it, when we were, when we matira nether, we okay the nether the mafer. That means we uproot the promise from its origin as if it never happened. Comes the Ramchal and writes, that's the idea of tshuva. He said, really, if you break a window, you have to pay for it. He said, what Hashem did was he created something called tshuva, which tshuva means that the window was never broken, it never happened. Chazal, for example, say, you're not allowed to remind the Baal de tshuva of avonotav harishonim, the sins that he did. Now, the simple understanding is, because it's not nice, the guy changed his ways, who cares what he did? Bygones are bygones. But that's a very shallow understanding. The deeper understanding is, is because it's an outright lie. He never did it. Once he did tshuva, it never happened. And if a person still thinks it happened, then he never did tshuva. And if somebody else thinks it happened, then he doesn't believe in tshuva. That's why a bal tshuva is called a tinok shenolad. Just like a ger, a newborn. It's like he was born again. Christians stole that idea from us, I used it in a commercialized verse. But the source of it is from the concept of tshuva. Now it has to be like that, because otherwise, every mitzvah benefits the world spiritually. And the world is not only the physical world that we see, it's the entire picture of the world and on an eternal level. Every sin, God forbid, does the opposite, damages the world eternally. So if something wouldn't be uprooted completely, then there would be a permanent damage to the world. The world would be scarred in so many ways. So in order to avoid that, God created a system that it's uprooted from its origin as if it never happened. And then at that point, it's not applicable. There's no damage done anymore, so there's nothing to fix. You have to understand how that works in practical elements, but this is enough to at least uh, encourage people to understand that just because somebody made a mistake doesn't make him a bad person. But, based on this, Ramchal says, that how, 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 do you, how are you okay to That you say, if I would have known what I'm doing, I would have never done it. He says, that's the idea of, being a, of doing tshuva. He says, to acknowledge that if I would have understood what I should be doing, I would have never done this. But you, all, but you have to acknowledge what you should have been doing. Now acknowledge is not because you heard a speech and you were so inspired and oh my God, let's play the violin. Acknowledge is because you're intellectually grounded and you actually studied and know the facts and can prove it beyond reasonable doubt. Otherwise it's all fake, you know. It's a... Somebody asked me once uh, what I think his paradise is going to look like. So I think that's an absurd question to ask because I was never there and if I would have been, I would have never left. So uh, I don't know, like how, how am I supposed to know? 
But the Torah says an exil ki valto, answer a fool. Baby. So if you answer a stupid question, you'll get a stupid answer. What should we do? So I told him, your paradise, I have an estimation of what it'll look like. So he said, what? I said, more or less like the New York Philharmonic. Concert with the New York Philharmonic. So he says, but I don't like classical music. I said, that's your problem. <laughs> he said, but where, where did that analogy come from? I said, if you're asking such a question, what does that mean? That your whole life is revolving around what emotional roller coaster you're on today. So this morning you got one of these daily clips that, well, oh my God, I got to be a better person, so now you're all inspired. And tomorrow you didn't uh, listen to the clip, or you didn't like the clip, so you're back to square one. So there's no brains behind it. So it's based on the tune of what's going on, whatever tune you heard playing that day. So, God's going to give you one big tune in paradise. You're going to go straight to paradise, and it'll be one big musical festival. It'll all be tunes based on your mood. In the intellectual world, world, that doesn't work. Nobody cares what you feel. Be grounded to the facts. Understand right and wrong. Understand the rationale behind right and wrong. And do what's right whether you feel it or not. I'm not feeling it today. Okay, and? And? That's what I tell my employees all the time, by the way. And I have many, many employees. I'm not in the mood of working today. I say, and? That's my only answer. One word. And? And they right away understand, time to leave. <laughs> There's nothing to discuss. And therefore what? Sometimes when they don't get it, so I tell them, and on Friday I'm not in the mood of set, making you a direct deposit of your paycheck. <laughs> Say, life works by your moods. <coughs> Sorry, I feel bad, you know. We allowed a generation to grow up now that, yeah, I do feel it, I don't feel it, I this. Uh. And we made everybody crazy from this. Everything has to feel right, feel good, feel this, feel that. Everything has to feel right, so when it doesn't feel right, then there's a lot of problems. One of them is called uh, depression. We want to eliminate that problem. This is one of the ways to eradicate depression, to be intellectually grounded. Comes to Ramchal and says an interesting thing. He says there are many examples in Chazal that we utilize in Halakha that clearly show that tshuva uproots something. One of the examples is, if a person, let's say, wasn't Shabbat observant for many years, and he had a business, and he worked on Shabbat, and he was in retail, Saturday is the biggest retail day, and the bulk of his money he made on Saturdays. And then one day he realized not keeping Shabbat is a stupid idea, and he decided he's starting to keep Shabbat. Does he have to throw out all the money he ever made all the years on Shabbat? No? At the most, he can't use it, which is not applicable because there were so many weekdays in the middle. But beyond that, no? But wait a second. If it's such not kosher money because it was made in a straight out sin on Shabbat in public, it doesn't get worse than that. So, how? Amchal says, because very simple, the day he regretted what he did, and that's, that's the only point that he even cares that he made money on Shabbat. So at that point, Hashem reverse the sin of Freya. He was okay. It's as if it never happened. So that's it. There's no problem. That's a huge chesed Hashem. I don't know much about the car business. Or about cars in general. I like nice cars, but that's the extent of it. But it's my understanding that a car that was in an accident, even if it was fixed, is worth a lot less than the same car in the same situation that was never in an accident. And somebody who is in the business explained to me that no matter how well a car is fixed, it's never like it was if it was untouched. That's in human laws, in human rules. In God's rules, it's not like that. Because the same God that created the world and created the rules of the world creates that the second you uproot what you did, it's definitely equal to its creation. But according to Chazal, the Gemara Barachot with David Melech, it's actually better than it initially was. So tshuva is also a mitzvah. So there's a great gift that somebody gets. Now the truth is, if somebody never had an opportunity to succeed in life and he didn't succeed, so I, you pity him a little bit, maybe, or you try to help him, give him opportunity, but that's the extent. But if somebody has golden opportunities time and time again and just doesn't care, 
you start losing pity for him. Because if you don't care, we can only care about you as much as you care about yourself. If you're not willing to care about yourself, then... So as great as the gift of tshuva is, that's how big of a responsibility it is. If there was no tshuva, or tshuva was a very complicated thing in a heart, so then, okay, people don't do tshuva. But if it's such a simple thing that can obtain such great benefits, and you spoon-fed it, and you still don't care, then it's a big problem already. That's pretty negligent and reckless. Now, it takes time, people time to digest things. Many times we get into conversations with people and they tell you, I need to digest it for a day or two and I'll get back to you. I'm one of those people. I like thinking things through. So Hashem gave us 30 days to digest now. From Rosh Chodesh Elul to Rosh Hashanah, he used to take 30 days. Day after day, reiterate again and again, digest. Where does the question really come? And we discuss this every year, but Baruch Hashem, we merit to give a different approach every year. That it seems to be that the whole thing is a joke. And it's a sad joke, not a funny joke. Last year, Lul, we gave nice speeches, we went to Slichot, we even gave a lot of money to charity. We came to Shul, Rosh Shana, we bought Aliyot for a lot of money. We, everybody looked also very holy on Rosh Shana last year. I remember the feeling and the vibe, tea leave and that. Didn't sleep by day and that. All different things. Looked really good. Motsai Kippur, they were already fighting over parking spaces. Literally. By Ni'ilah, they're already rushing the Chazan that his Avit's taking too long. The chocolate cake was more important than Kriyat Shema. That's how long it lasted, the whole show. And this happens every year again. So come on, when's the point that the joke's over? <coughs> Besides, why does Hashem put up with this? If you did something wrong to me and came to apologize, I'm a very forgiving person by nature. Say, so love you never happened. But if you did it 40 times in a row, and every time you came with the same nonsense story and didn't stick to it, I don't think I'll be that tolerant anymore. Every year. And not one person. The whole Jewish nation every year again. Same story. Come into shul, put up a nice act. Some people a better act, some people not even such a good act. Walk away. Hashem says, go eat happily. Yeah? And... By the time Kippur is over, business back to usual. I once went on a campaign, this was 15 years ago, during Elu, and I never did it again because it was one of the most failing campaigns ever, that people should take upon themselves that from when they leave Shul, Motzei Kippur, until the next morning after Shachari, they should behave like a Jew. 15 hours. And nobody called me with any success stories. So I realized what a failing campaign it is. 15 hours, that's all. That's the whole story, just 15 hours. Be sure that by at least the next morning, I didn't get angry at anybody, I didn't gossip, I didn't say anything stupid, I didn't... I controlled myself. <coughs> that was 15 years ago. So if we do the Yeridata Dorot cycle, if today we'll ask for five minutes, I don't know if it might be too much. But Hashem was the one who created this. This wasn't our creation to do this motion. God was the one who created it. So God set us up for failure? Or God set us up to make a mockery out of Him? Doesn't make sense, right? That can't be. So it has to be something deeper over here. It has to be a pshat. So many, many discuss this. The simple answer based on Chazal is, is that Hashem judges a person by Asher Husham, the way he is at that given moment. We learned that from Ishmael. Kishamael, Okimel, Kola, Nao, Ba'asher Husham. And if that's the case, Hashem says, well, let me give you a solution. I want you to be saved. So put up a show for a day, and I'll judge you based on that show. And what happens the next day is not applicable anymore. And yeah, God took it into consideration. And he gave us the trick to beat the system. He created a system and gave us the trick to beat it. That's the simple answer, and there's a lot of truth to it. It just has to be explained for many more hours than the one sentence I said now, that it should be rational and not an, a cheap way out of life. But there's more to it. The Navi in Cheskel teaches us, Peklamit Gimel, Pasuk Yud Aleph. Hashem says that a prophet to tell the Jewish people, Emor Aleim, tell them, Chayani, 
חי אני איזה שבועה, השם סוויז, נאום השם אלוקים, נקרא לזה סווירינג. doesn't tell the prophet just a prophecy to repeat. סווירינג. אם אכפוץ במות הרשע, do you think I want an, uh, an evil person to die? It's not my desire for a wicked person to die. כי אם only בשובו, בשוב רשע מדרכו, that the evil person or the wicked person, not evil, wicked, um, repents, וחיה, and he lives, and therefore, שובו, שובו, השם pleads with the Jewish nation. Please repent, מדרכיכם הרעים, from your evil ways, ולמה תמותו בית ישראל? Why would you want to end up, God forbid, with a tragedy? So if Hashem wanted to give over a message to the Navi, and he wanted the Navi to give it over to the Jewish nation, right? The Navi is not allowed to be Kovish Nevuato. That's why Yechezkiel said it over. So he could have said, Jews, I'm asking you, do tshuva. I'm waiting for you to do tshuva. I have a lot of patience. I don't want this to end up bad. I want it to end up good. That's the whole idea of the world. Do tshuva and everything will be fine. Why does he have to tell the Navi, go tell the Jews that I made a shvua, I swore. Shem didn't swear when he said to keep Shabbat. He didn't swear when he said to put on tefillin. Yeah? Suddenly over here, when it came to telling the Jews to do tshuva, Hashem made a shvua, chai Hashem. Makes a shvua, he swears. Tell the Jews I swore. Suddenly God has to swear. This is a question many ask. Amongst them, Abchatz Kalabamsky used to say this speech before Kiyat Shofar. And Abchatzka used to say before Tkiyat Shofar that the reason why Hashem made a Shvua was because Hashem knew that when a Jew is starting to think about doing Tshuva, the first thing that the Yitzhah tells him is, who are you fooling? Last year you did Tshuva also, and look at you now. Yesterday you did Tshuva also, and look at you now. Three hours ago you said you wouldn't do it, and now you already did it again. You're wasting your, your time and God's time. And he gives up. So Hashem told the Navi, so nobody should ever give up. Go tell him, not only am I saying that I don't want anything bad to happen to them, therefore I'm going to wait until it works, as many, no matter how many times they fail along the way. I swear that despite whatever evil actions they do, I will stick to my word and still wait, no matter how far they push the limits. Dafka here, because it's so irrational, why should God wait so long? Why should he accept the constant cycle of nothing? He order for people to believe it, in order for people to be able to accept it. Dafka here, Hashem had to make a shvua, so he should be willing to accept it. But now we have a shvua from Hashem, the kilachpots b'mot arasha. B'mot arasha is not only death. If somebody's alive and not doing anything productive of himself, that's a lot worse than dead. At least when you're dead, you're not harmful. You're alive and not doing anything productive. By default, you're doing something counterproductive. That's harmful. You'd be a lot better off if they wouldn't be alive. Chaim Velozhin, very famous story, took one of his close students to the window one day and asked him what he sees downstairs. Chaim lived on the second floor. And he told him he sees people. He said, who do you see? He says, this person, that person, whoever he recognized, he told him. And some people he didn't recognize. And he said, I don't know, we're not looking out of the same window. He said, well, why, Rebbe, what do you see? He said, I see a cemetery. He said, a cemetery? We don't even live close to the cemetery. What are you talking about? He said, you see over there that thing? He was pointing to a person. He said, yeah. He said, that guy's a genius. Could have been a big Talmud Chacham, big Baal Chesed, helped people. Instead, he's roaming the streets, going shopping. I don't see a person. I see a matseva, a tombstone that says, Ponitman, here was buried. A person who could have been a Gdolado. See that woman over there? She could have ran the whole Bikur Cholim in town. Instead, she's gossiping with her friends. So I see a tombstone that says, Ponitman Bikur Cholim. Here's buried the Bikur Cholim. That should have happened. That was his view on things. I always say the best Musa that a person can get is in the mirror. You should look in the mirror and see if he sees a person or he sees a tombstone. Are you utilizing your potential or it's another ponitman? Could have been. Sometimes people tell me, you know, when I was younger, I used to learn. So I knew, and now that you're older and more mature, you should be learning more, not less. 
They always hear the stories about the used to. Now you're older, you're more mature, you have more responsibility. So, so what happened along the way? What went wrong? But Lama said, let's not fool ourselves with anybody else. Nobody's changing overnight and nobody's becoming the next Lama Dvav Tzadik and whatever. We might have a lot of hidden tzaddikim in this generation, it's very possible. I want to judge the Jewish nation favorably. And I want to say that this, we're better than every generation ever because we know how to hide our tzitkut so well that nobody could find it. I hope God could find it, but nobody else could find it, that's for sure. We really did. We're on such a high level, there was never such a thing before. We know how to hide it in such a good way. Unbelievable. But so, on a practical level, I like practical tachlis. What do we walk away with? What do you take home? So I'm going to give you something practical. Okay, let's do it this way. There's a Zohar. Now, I'm not quoting the entire Zohar. I'm taking bits and pieces and copy and pasting a little bit together just to come out with a point. So, um, you know, when I quote, I quote word for word and I say, well, but here, I'm giving you the disclaimer. The, I'm skipping a lot. But the punchline of the Zohar is more or less a parable that goes roughly like this. That there was a king that had a guy who was a musician that he liked a lot. And he used to call him to the castle all the time to, to play music for him. He enjoyed listening to him play music. One day, people, the authorities, whatever you want to call them, come to the king and tell him, King, listen, this guy, I know you like him, and I know he plays music for you, and he's definitely a talented individual, there's no question about it. But you don't know the whole story with him. He's not such a good person. I don't know if you want to be associated with him. And the king says, what do you mean? He said, he's a thief. He steals a lot of money. And not just he steals from people in general. King, he's stealing from you. On his way in, he takes this. On his way out, he takes that. He's doing a job on you. In those days, he steal from the king. That was a death sentence for sure. There was no question about it. And everybody was sure the guy, he's going to call the guy, confront him, and there'll be witnesses, and they'll hang him. That's going to be the end. And the king says, how do you know? So he says, I saw it. So he tells the guy, I don't believe you. He says, why don't you believe me? He says, because you're jealous of him, that he has a talent that you don't have, so you're making up a story. So he says, I'll bring you other people that saw it. So he brings in the next two people. He tells them, you guys, I don't believe you either. Why? Because you hate his, what are his cousins, so you have an agenda against the family. Next people that tell him, and... Person after person is coming to testify that he, this guy, this musician is a crook. He's brushing them off, each one with a different far-fetched excuse. And instead of listening to what they're saying consistently, so many accusers, he's actually accusing them of being biased and wrong. And the people knew the king was an intelligent, rational man, and he doesn't just brush things off like that. So it was a pellet to them. They, they were puzzled by this whole thing. What's Peshat? What was more puzzling, time went by, and out of the blue one day, the king calls one of his guys, and he says, bring this and this guy from his house, arrest him, we're hanging him today. I said, on what grounds? He stole from me for years already. One of the advisors here is this, he says, wait a second, king. We came, to already, we came to you already years ago and told you that he's stealing. We brought you all the witnesses in the world, telling you the details and the times and the proof, the evidence as clear as could be. And you went and made a mockery out of all of us and pushed us all away and threw us all away. And now with no new story, with no new nothing, out of the blue, you just bring him. What happened? And the king tells the guy like this. Just let me tell you what happened. He said, he was a thief. I knew that all along. I knew that before you told me. But the money he stole from me, I could afford and at the end of the day, I used to enjoy it. Every night he would come, I would eat dinner, and he'd play music, and I was in seventh heaven, I was enjoying myself. So I said, whatever, okay, he's stealing, what should I do? I was very angry about it inside, but it was worth it for me to put up with it, to get the benefit out of the guy, for him to be playing music. He said, but yesterday he was in an accident, and his arm got cut off, so he can't play music anymore. So now he's worthless to me. And at the end of the day, he's been stealing from me for years. Chutzpah, should be hung. Comes the Zohar and writes that the Torah, Gdosha, the Akadosh is the biggest tune. David HaMelech, Hashem had ta'anot on him, but at the end of the day, it still says the quote that he called the Torah music. Zmirot ha'yu lichukecha. Hashem had ta'anot, that's undermining the Torah. But at the end of the day, 
the voice of the Torah that comes out of Jewish boys and girls when they sit and learn Torah, each one in the learning that they are obligated in, is the greatest music that goes Rochu. So the Yitzhak comes and he tells God, you know, this one is doing this and this one is doing that and she did this sin and he did that sin. And Hashem says, you yeah. I don't believe you, and 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 he pushes them all away. Why? Because he likes hearing that voice. It's worth it for him. But if God forbid that voice stops, then he says, okay, so now uh, what's, my, what's left? I have no use for this person. So if a person wants an Eitzah, to go into Rosh Hashanah, and to go in with confidence, Shibtuchim Shnei Zakaim Badin, and this applies to men and women, we don't discriminate, everything is equal. I'm a firm believer in equal rights. It's to learn Torah. Men have a chiyuv with Talmud Torah in one way, and women have a different chiyuv with Talmud Torah. When a boy sits and learns a Mishnah, the Kosh sits and listens to him, Shechina Kenegdo, the Gemara says. Hashem is sitting opposite him and learning with him. You learned the daf today? I don't want to ask you guys personal questions, so don't answer. Let's hope we all learned the daf today. When we learned the daf today, Hashem was sitting with us, Learning Chavrusa opposite us. I'll tell you a story from Chaim Briska. Rav Shach told me this story once. I was a 16 year old troubled teenager. I knew how to learn very well, very, very well. Shun gave me a gift for high IQ, thank God. But uh, yeah, I also knew how to do other things, let's just say. Once I decided to go into Rav Shach and uh, talk, see where I'm going to get by telling him my thoughts about life. And I know today people think Rav Shach was a scary, I don't know, whatever, tough person. Such a distortion of the truth. He was the most warm, loving, soft, caring rabbi. I don't know, there's no way to describe it. And I went into him, and I started having it out. I was an idiot, young kid. I didn't realize talking to the Gdola Doa, some respect, some filter, something. I was an idiot. I thought, wow, but listen, I love learning and that, but you know, there's also other things going on in the world. So I got a balance. Mizeh o mizeh al tanach yadcha. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, depending on the day, depending on the circumstance. And you would think he would cut me off, he wouldn't let me continue, right? Because I'm talking stupidity outright. He listened like nothing, like he has all the time in the world. No rush. Heard me out. He tells me, I'm going to tell you a story from Abchaim. Just so of age, he tell. He said, by Abchaim, one day a boy came into him. It was a big Ely. And he liked learning and everything. And whatever. A scholar got them, whatever it was, and he decided he's leaving the yeshiva. And he went into Abchaim to say goodbye. He wasn't in a fight with anybody. He just wasn't interested. He's out. And he had a lot, on the contrary, he had looked up to Abchaim. So he wanted to leave on good terms with him. So he goes into Abchaim and he tells him, Rabbi, Thank you for all the years that I learned in here, and uh, I gained a lot. It was amazing, a great experience. I have only fond memories, beautiful. But now, you know, I'm in, I want to go learn philosophy and other things. Uh, I've got to take a break for a few years. I'm going to check out the world at large. So I came to say goodbye, I want to leave. So Prime tells him, you have no right to leave. So he says, really, with me, I have no right to leave. Even if you're going to sell me the Jewish story, God himself says it, there's free will. So I have every right to leave. And you have no right to interfe interfere with my free will. And Chayef says, you're 100% right. Everything that has to do with you, you have free will. And if this decision affected you, I wouldn't say a word. I would shake your hand, smile to you, and send you on your way. And then he opens him a Gemara. And he says, but let's learn a piece of Gemara that we both know very well. The Gemara says that when you sit and learn Torah, Shechina Kenegdo, Hashem is sitting opposite you and learning with you. Maybe you want to close your Gemara, fine, that's your free will, that's your right. But what gives you the head to close Hashem's Gemara? How can you take away Hashem's Chavrusa? What's, how's that fair? You don't have free will about God. No, he didn't leave. Shach told me, no, I can't tell you anything, but I could quote Rav Chaim, that much I could do. You don't want to learn, don't, but, but what gives you the right to close Hashem's Gemara? Now you see how the words of a tzaddik have an impact. I'm not saying I became a tzaddik. Far from it. And I went to continue doing what I was going to do. 
But no matter what situation I was in in life, I never let go of learning. And sometimes it was it looked so crazy to my friends. I was doing things that were very far from the way the Jewish uh, world, uh, the Jewish, the way Hashem wants it to be. But not to learn a ketzois, not to sit and learn it, it wasn't an option. It wasn't an option. It was Because that idea of learn, and I can tell you that that's what saved me in life. Because that connection never died out, no matter what, under any circumstance. And years later, when I rebounded a little bit, and then went to try and have some sort of support system for others to do the same, I realized you come to people tell them, keep this, keep that. Not only doesn't it work, it's counterproductive almost always. It lasts for a year, they give up, and then they resent it all. But if you go to somebody and say, come learn. Learning won't kill you. It's good to gain knowledge. What you do with it, do whatever you want. Come learn. It works every single time. I gave classes. I'm talking about serious classes, not story time. Um, complicated sugyot and shas. In India, for Israeli boys and girls after the army that were high on God knows how many different things, the world was spinning around them. They were sitting on the floor. They didn't even sit on chairs. They're sitting on mats on the floor. The room is a cloud of smoke. And whatever their brain was able to accept, they're listening and listening and listening. And the next day, they're begging you, don't leave, we want to learn. So what then? Look at you guys. You're high like a kite. You're, forget about Judaism. You're, even as a humane, you're, you're living in a hostel that God knows if you took a shower in a month. There's nothing human left to you. Oh, what do you mean? What you taught us last night was amazing. We want to learn more. And they learn, and they learn, and then one day, boom. It all turns around. I remember when Rav Shach Zitzel started Leib La'achim. So he made Rav Uri Zohar, Hashim Badel Chayim Tavim, Hashem Shem a long life, he's not young anymore. He's, uh, he's the tzaddik of our generation. It's uh, Rav Akiva of our generation. Literally like Rav Akiva, he became from when he was 40, uh, gave up a big life to become Rav Akiva of our generation. And uh, so he made a uh, Uizor in charge. And he told Uizor, I don't want no seminars and no speeches and no events and no nothing. I want and only one thing. Take Kolo guys, once a week at night, send them to all the non-religious towns in Israel. They should randomly knock on doors and ask them, would you let me in to learn with you five minutes, Gemara? Or Pasuk and Chumash, or Mishnah. That's it. That's all that should be done. They shouldn't get into arguments with them. They shouldn't discuss with them. They shouldn't... Nothing! Straight. Walk in, learn a little Tanakh, a little Gemara, a little whatever it is. Walk out. Goodbye. Tens and tens of thousands of Baalei Tshuva came out of that. From all walks of life. But nobody ever told them a word. Ma'or Sheba Machzirei Ulimutav, the light of the Torah, brings them back. Like Hoshvokhu says, that sound of people learning, that's what I want most. That's what I want most. So I'm going to give you some, just an example of something that most of us can't live up to, but at least we should know that there are people that do care. In the company that my wife works for, there's a gentleman who's in a high position in the company that doesn't take PTO the entire year. No summer vacation, no this, no that. It works, 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 works. For one goal. He has an arrangement with the company that from 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he leaves three hours early every day during the entire month of Elul to go to Kolel to learn from 2 in the afternoon until at night when he goes home. His whole year is Ganeida. Every day that his friends took off to go skiing and he stayed at work because he's saving up his PTO to be able to take off in Elul, is a, new, is, a, is a new world that's being created in Shemaim. Hashem looks at him every day of the year and says, by him it's Rosh Hashanah every day. He's living like a mensch every day. I personally give everybody an eight, at least I said to you, Shuva, maybe you should consider that. It says clearly in Allah Chaim, because you should be more sick with so plan it for now. Then I said to you, my you're going to take off a little bit from work to do something Jewish. And there's not that many days, right? I have a said to you, my One day is Kippur, one day is Erev Kippur, you're off anyway. One day is Shabbat Shuva, one day is Friday, and two days are Rosh Hashanah. So that's six out of ten. So we're talking about four days. 
And, that, and this year, one of those days is a Sunday, so it's three work days. Plan, Three days, I'm going to take off half a day to show you that I care. That I want you to hear the voice of Torah. Now, for boys, it's clear, right? You can come, you can learn. I said the daf, whatever it is, each one, whatever he wants to learn. But uh, girls are, are obligated to learning Torah too. In Halakha, it says a girl's the reason why a girl makes Birkat Torah is because she's obligated to learning Torah, which Torah, all Divei Hashkafa, Musar, and Halachot that pertain there. So, just we're going to give a minor list. The list is way longer. But all Hilchot Brachot, Hilchot Fila, Hilchot Shabbat, Hilchot Nida, Hilchot Kashrut. Should I continue? Just that alone, when you finish that, come back to me, but by then it's already 120. A girl is obligated to learn. So a girl has an equal obligation to learn. Like a guy, there's no difference. And what's wrong with knowing something? Why does everybody always have to be an idiot? Learn a little bit. It's not going to kill you. Learn a little bit. Know a little bit. You feel good about yourself also. Man, she knows something. You know why it's like that. You don't do things blindly. When you do things blindly, you resent it after a while. because You don't connect with it. When you understand why you're doing something, there's a big chance you'll connect to it, that it means something to you at that point. Besides, for a girl for sure, but even for a boy, because David HaMelech prayed, even though it's in the Rishonim, if his prayer was answered or not, but uh, when you read Tilim, it's also a version of learning. For a girl for sure, probably for a guy as well. No, so. Reading Tilim is a good thing too. I'm saying reading Tilim from the heart, not lip service, mumbling words that you don't understand and don't care. Connecting. Understanding, living the Tehillim. That's why I don't like the term so much, reading Tehillim. Living the Tehillim. And it's for sure better to read much less Tehillim, but to understand what you're saying and to connect with it than to read a lot of Tehillim and it's meaningless. Besides, we see clearly that even the delay sale that never did anything besides for learning, like the Chazanish, the Stipler and others, in the month of Elul and Asayti made Shuva, they devoted a few minutes a day to read Tehillim. Because there is a certain koach in Tehillim that even learning can't give you. So if I die in these days, to add on a little bit of reading Tehillim every day, it's a very important thing. And Hashim Nashim V'taf, everybody. I think even young children should be trained to read Tehillim from the time they can read anything. That should be the first thing they know how to read before anything else. Because when a kid learns, it's in his DNA from a young age, then it makes a big difference in his behavior going on later on in life. And it's a real shmira. It's a real protection. It's a real, real protection for the way the year goes on. And Sometimes you can invest a little bit and get a huge return when there's a time of opportunity. Other times you invest a lot and get almost no return because there's not much opportunity then. Right? Those of you who study economics, you understand the economic cycle and the way that works. Elul is the time of opportunity. A small investment in Elul gives, reaps you huge benefits in Olam Hazeh and Olam Hava. The same investment during the year is also amazing and should be done, of course. But it's already, there's only a certain amount that it could accomplish. So Dafka now is the time. And that's why Dafka now, the Yitzhah is going full force. Especially this year. This year's Erev Shemitah, right? It's going to be Shemitah. Shana Shemitah. Starts the Mitzvah of Shemitah. Tziviti et Birkati. Nu Chazal say, Vashishit kolot, Vashvit milchamot, Motzei Shvit ben David ba. Shemitah means that it's a sign that uh, Mashiach comes. It's not that he will. It's man am sugal. So before Mashiach comes, the Yitzhar knows that the day Mashiach comes, he's dead. So what does a soldier do when he's wounded in battlefield and he knows he's dying any second because he's bleeding out? He takes out his gun and he shoots to every angle because he has nothing to lose at that point. He's angry at the world. So right now the Yitzhar is angry at the world. So he's shooting at every angle. He's going crazy. Shooting at every angle. In Israel, these are the Shaim that think they're leading the government. Yeravan ben Avat and his friends said... I had the chutzpah to say yesterday that they might have to do a lockdown because of this new, whatever, some sort of strain. And 
they're going to plan it that the lockdown should be Rosh Hashanah Kippur, because then anyway people work less. So it won't affect the economy so badly. Meaning shul is not important. People not having normal holidays is not important. People not hearing shofar, that's not important. But they think that's going to benefit the economy. If only these idiots would know what Hashem thinks about what they said. And over here we had a nace in New York. That one of the sonei said, Hashem took him down this week. And has him resigning exactly a week before Rosh Hashanah, so he shouldn't give us problems with the shuls this year. I want to re remind you of a quote. He went onto the media and told, in his words, I'm just quoting him, I want to tell my, the Orthodox Jews that if they don't comply to it, I'm going to shut down your synagogues. And then a day later went back to the media and said, when the numbers start going down, it's not, it's not God's doing, it's, not the, it's my doing. So this week when he announced his resignation, I just wanted to replay him. It's not God's doing. It's not people that hate you doing it. It's your doing, idiot. Yeah, Hashem made a nice for the firm world. He said, you know what? I don't want you to have a problem this year, Shana Kippur. It's bad enough that in Israel they might have a problem. At least I'll save part of the Jewish nation to pray for Am Yisrael. So I'm going to take the Jew Ada down. Hopefully there'll be more to follow quickly. We have a few more of those that also have issues. Murphy, thank God, has an election coming up, so he has to behave for now at least until November, so hopefully he won't make it. But uh, why do all these crazy things happen? It's a horror, realizing, wait, his days are limited, it's almost over for him. He knows, Shemitah, Motzei Shvi'it Ben David Ba, Motzei Shvi'it Moshiach comes. So he's, he's going crazy. So he's like, I'm going to shoot in every angle I can just to stop. But we're going to be stronger, we're going to be bigger and better, we're not going to get scared. We'll hold on tight, we'll be proud Jews, stay strong, do the right thing. Hashem will hear the voice of Torah more during this month. We'll hear the voice of Tehili more during this month. And the more voices of Tzedakah Chesed. As the Chavetz Chaim says, if a person supports somebody who's learning Torah, so he has that Torah. All of us, that we support families that are learning. Oh Hashem, we know how many. Kein Yilbu. There should always be more families that they shouldn't need the support, but as long as they need it, we should be able to support them. All that Torah is credited to us. It's as if we're sitting and learning all those hours a day. There are people in this room that learn maybe uh, 40,000 hours a day. They don't even know it. When they come to Gan Eden, they'll know. They learn 40,000 hours in 24 hours. Because all those people that were able to learn because of the means that they had, then that was their learning. And when Hashem hears that zmirot, it's about that person. Because without that, it wouldn't happen. It's an unbelievable schus. It's an unbelievable thing. That's one of the reasons why it's part of the condition of tshuva is staka because you also have to have the voice of Torah and staka is a mean to have the voice of Torah Hashem will help that it should be a productive Elul and a happy Elul and we should do tshuva bahava b'simcha not out of fear it's like this all our various become mitzvahs and if all our various become mitzvahs wow we're going to a good place in Ghana Shabbat Shalom